Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We have been in the middle of a series, we're right in the middle of a series called Where Do We Grow From Here? And we are learning that how you define church determines the way you live and engage in your church, and that the health of the church determines the impact of its reach. We're learning that that we grow spiritually individually, but as we grow, the whole church grows. And if we're growing and we're healthy, the greater the impact our reach is in our world. That's been the thesis of it. We've covered worship. These are the basics of Christianity, and we want to grow in them. We've covered worshiping with God and worshiping God. We've covered being with the body of Christ by growing together or coming together. And we were, we were told in Scripture that we spur one another on. We motivate one another to love and good deeds. And you can't do that from afar. you got to get close, and you got to be there to pray for one another and be together. By the way, it's beautiful to see so many back here today as well. And we also uh, talked about prayer last week. And so today I have the task of covering two, two of them. And we're going to cover that we as a church serve faithfully and we give joyfully. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 and we'll be in verse 20. We serve faithfully. Jesus is with his disciples And this is what happens, verse 20. And it will be on the screen as well for you. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? He's talking about the cross that he's about to experience. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yes, yes. We are able. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from the bitter cup. And just so you know, James was beheaded later on for following Christ. And John was um, exiled to the island of Patmos where he would later receive the revelation of the end times. And he wrote the book uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the book of Revelation. So they did suffer. And he says, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they weren't offended at all. They were happy that they asked that question. No, it says they were upset. They were indignant. They were furious. But Jesus called them together because there was, there was some pain there, and they needed to bring some peace back to this fellowship. And so he says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what drives our message on serving here. And I want to give you a heads up for guests um, that as a pastor here, I just want you to know that uh, we speak the truth in love and we teach the Bible. And this goes for all of us, right? Um, And that we don't apologize for what Scripture says. And um, but I always do it in love. Amen. (laughs) You might not want to clap yet. No, I'm just joking. Just joking. You can clap. And. And I always preach to myself first. I always search myself first. And so, uh, just so you know, sometimes in sermons, we'll feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
And it's not, I, I don't have to prepare a message of conviction. I just have to preach the word. And the Holy Spirit will do those things. And the Holy Spirit will also encourage you where you need to be encouraged and, and refine us and teach us. And so I let the Holy Spirit do that. So have an open heart today because what we're going to read is, uh, you know, we were singing a song, God of Revival. And we're singing that. But do, you, do we realize that we are the hands and feet of revival? And that we can't just sing about revival. We have to be about revival. And this, this message today is putting the hands and feet to our worship. We don't just worship God with our lips. We worship God with our hands and our feet. And next week, we're going to talk about evangelism as another core thing that we do at Calvary. So we've moved from internal worship and being together as a body, encouraging each other to prayer. And now we're moving to action with our worship. And so we're talking about serving. And we're learning here that Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom... Serve. Serve. The word serve is also the word used for minister in scripture or ministry. And so serving isn't just for pastors or ministers. Serving is for all of us. And in the Hebrew word, sharat, it has to do with wait on others or to serve others. In the New Testament, it was the same meaning. It had to do with serving and ministry, not dominion or power over people. And yet Jesus is the Lord of the universe, and he humbles himself and serves. And so he calls his people to serve as well. Over the years, I would ask believers, how are you doing on your, your spiritual growth? What are you doing to grow your faith? And everyone always answers the same questions. And now that you're hearing this, the insider information, now you're probably going to answer me differently if I ever ask you. But they would say, typically, well, yeah I've, been, yeah, I've been attending church, or I've been doing a good, and this, whether they come here or somewhere else, it doesn't matter. I, I've been attending church, or you know, I've been struggling. I've been reading my Bible, or I, not, not so much, or I've been praying, or I'm struggling with prayer. Do you know that no one ever mentions serving as a growth principle, as a way of growing? And yet, that's what Jesus did. And he calls us to serve as well. Why would serving help us grow? Because it grows our humility, our care, our love for others, and we become more like Jesus. If Jesus served, then my goodness, we better be serving. Amen? Now, here's the thing. We don't do it out of compulsion or manipulation or guilt. No, we don't serve because of that. We serve God because it's a result of our salvation. Listen to this scripture from Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. He says, for Christ's love compels us to do this ministry. He's talking about his ministry. Because we are convinced that one died for all, Jesus died for all, and therefore all died. Those who believe in Christ have died to their old life and are now raised in new life in Christ. So water baptism there, you died to your old life, you come back out, and now you do what? Okay, you died to your old life. Now you're alive in Christ, living your new life. What does that entail? Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. See, serving is, is a great antidote for selfishness. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for God, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We live for God for the one who died for us and was raised again to give us eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that you can't boast that you've saved yourself. We, we couldn't take the cross. We couldn't handle that. And our lives were not perfect enough to even pay for all the sin in the world. Jesus did that for us. We don't work for his salvation. We don't serve to be saved. That is very key. You believe in Jesus Christ. He declares you righteous in God's eyes. You are holy and forgiven. And out of that relationship of love, you want to serve God. And you know what? It's part of God's salvation plan for your life. I say this all the time, I'll say it again. If we weren't supposed to do anything after salvation, we would be beamed up to heaven. 
Lord, I believe in you as my Savior. Thank you for everything. It was disappear. But there's work to be done. God's worship turns into work. It turns into work. And he even prepared us in advance for that. Look at verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. One translation says masterpiece, work of art. How though? Created in Christ Jesus, not your own creation. Christ Jesus created that in you to do good works, to serve which God prepared in advance for you. Now, just so you know, with this scripture, God intends to work through you, not watch you work. Now, that changes some things because now you're able to accomplish even more than you ever thought or imagined. See, he comes into your life through the Holy Spirit and he wants to work through you. That scared me when I read that this week because you know what I thought of right away? That if I don't do the good works and serving, I'm stopping God from working in my own life. Ooh, that scared me. Like God wants to work through me, but he's a gentleman and he believes that he's going to give us the will to do it, the free will to do it. And so we must choose to cooperate with God and serve. Again, why? Not of, out of obligation, but out of appreciation. Think about this for a moment. Think about this when serving God. Serving is an overflow of all the love you've received from God. There's so much joy in your life you can't contain but share it. You have so much energy and joy in healing, and you, and you used to be broken, but now you've been saved, and you can't help but use this energy and this change in your life to help other people come to experience what you've experienced. That is my basic definition of serving. You can't help it. And as you serve others, whether it's in the church or outside the church, and you use your gifts and you use your saved life, it brings you so much joy, you want to keep serving. I wrote this down. I want to read it. Serving others is a powerful testimony of what God can do with someone who was once lost and broken, but is now found and useful. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes if God's up there like, ooh, I can't wait to change this person's life. This is going to be amazing. Wait till they see how this person changes. And ooh, man. This is going to be awesome. They're, they're, going to, they're going to be like, why is this person different? Wow, look, at they're doing so many amazing things for, for who? For God. And by the way, that brings glory to God, not us. We serve not to bring glory to ourselves, but to God. God, I, I tell you, I, when I was reading this and studying this and praying over this, I just sense that God loves to change lives so he can show off how beautiful he is and so it would change other people's lives. How amazing and powerful he is. And so when we serve, people get to see a changed life changing other lives. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 teaches us that when God wants the church to grow, he calls us to serve one another. When he wants the church to grow, he calls us to serve one another. Here's what the scripture says. Verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. And again, we use this quite often in here in the church. We're giving you a little series and vision of who we are as a church. So I wanted to read this again. But he says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work some say, translations say, works of service, and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Why? Why are we doing this? To measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ, to become more like Jesus. Then we will no longer be immature like children, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. So he's talking about spiritual maturity here and knowledge and understanding. 
We would not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Growing, just look at these words, they're powerful. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. My goodness. If that's not motivating to start helping each other grow, I don't know what is. It's beautiful. We're interdependent of one another for growth, too, is what we're hearing here. We're to become like Jesus. We're to come to church and go to our word during the week, reading the Bible, and go to small groups and meetings and trainings, not just to get fed, but to turn that into a hands ministry and feet ministry to serve, to work. We're supposed to be equipped. My job as a pastor is to equip you to go do more work because the Lord knows it takes everyone doing it. And it's also because you're valuable. It's also because not only Ryan has been saved and and God has prepared good works for him, but God has saved you and you're just as special. And he has great works for you to do. And those great works are going to lead someone to Jesus. It's that simple. Now, the implications of, of us not doing this, of us not coming together and growing together and serving one another and using our giftings, the implications are dangerous. We are spiritually immature, we fall for lies, and we do not become more like Jesus in our world. That's concerning. I personally am motivated to know the Word of God, to grow and to equip my kids so that they grow. And when the church serves, we don't stunt the growth of the church. But we also are being inundated with so many lies and false teachings and different philosophies attacking the Word of God that if we're not being equipped and learning the Word, we're We're at risk of hurting our own home. Are you following me? And so that's a motivating reason why me as a father reads the word. Even if I'm tired, even if I I need more focus, I'm reading it for myself and then I'm reading it for everyone around me. And then God's going to lead me to someone and I need to pour Jesus into them and I can because I've been filled with Jesus and the word of God. So let me give you some practical application to this. Uh, The church that is getting things done in the community is open and active because it has people who are serving faithfully. That's just it. You cannot get ministry done in this world without the hands and feet of God's people. It's that simple. We can't accomplish the work that needs to be done in Delaware and beyond if it isn't if it's just one person or a group of pastors or leaders of a church, it takes all of us. And those who serve discover and experience the tangible work, power, and presence of God, just so you know. And I say this, and I say this humbly with love, those who do not serve, those missing in action, miss God in action. Those missing in action, M-I-I, M-I-A, you miss God in action. My kids know God is real. They see him working because I'm working for the kingdom of God and God is showing up. And we celebrate and we tell them the good things that happened to us. And we tell them the miracles that are taking place in this church. We tell them about the provision of God every time someone blesses. We tell them the good news. The Bible also tells us to do that as well. Don't miss out on God in action. It's amazing. Did you know that the 2080 principle is, is true? 2080, you know what that is? 20% of the people do 80% of the work. <laughs> you might be like, yeah, it's like that in my workplace too. 
You know, the Bible talks about that, that laziness is not right. Entitlement is not right. And a lot of people make the mistake when they see a church our size, and they'll go, oh, there's plenty of people serving. I'm sure they're okay. Wrong. God bless the people who serve every week here on Sundays and throughout the week with our youth and our nursery and our kids. But here's the thing. They will burn out if we don't pitch in and help. They will burn out. If they have to serve every week, they will burn out, and we don't want to do that. We also don't want people to miss out on what God is doing either. So we serve. We help. We're gifted. We have abilities. God has empowered us to do good things in different ministries. So I got good news for you. We have opening spots in every ministry. Woo-hoo! We got spots open in every ministry. Because we don't want to just maintain, we want to thrive. We don't want it to be the same people doing it every week because they're robbing you from using your gifts. Step up and watch God work. And man, we're going to help other people get some rest too. I'm thinking about our nursery right now. We need amazing moms to just take a week at a time to help out in our nursery so that other moms can get a break. It'd be amazing for parents to get a break, you know? Our kids' ministry, here, let me give you some places you can serve. Uh, not, not only does every ministry have open spots, but I have a heart for the next generation. I think about little Rowan, right? One day, she's going to be up here worshiping God as a teenager, unless God takes you some other state or God comes back, Jesus comes back. One day, she's going to be here, and she's going to worship God because we all did our part to help her grow, and we're still here. The next Rowan's coming up to serve. I love that name, by the way, beautiful name. Our, our nursery, our kids, our youth, our G team, which is our outreach ministry to kids, our Rangers program for boys, it's like our um, Boy Scouts program, but for, for Christians, for the Rangers, all those ministries, those next generation. But here's another one. How about new believers in this room or outside this church that need someone to help them follow Jesus? Man, we know the Bible inside and out. Some people don't even know where to turn. We can serve people by coming alongside them and helping them understand Scripture praying for them, and guiding them in the way of the Lord. I better move forward and get into we give joyfully. It's a joy to give. It really is. It's a joy to give. God calls the church to be joyful and generous givers. And I'll give some actions for this for both points at the end here. I love what 2 Corinthians 8, 7 says. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. That's cool because you can excel in a lot of things, but don't leave out the giving is what Paul's saying. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies, now I love these next two verses. This is God who supplies. Now God who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched or blessed in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That last part is powerful. As you're generous, God pours out even more generosity to you because he sees a faithful steward of generosity. He sees that generosity. He goes, let me bless them with more because they're going to be a channel of generosity. They do it cheerfully. What is giving? Giving of income and finances is an act of worship to God. 
It's an act of worship to God. We honor and we reflect God's generous nature when we are generous in all ways, not just with finances. Giving is an opportunity to grow in faith, trust, and obedience to God. I love what someone once said. Giving is not God's way of raising money. It is God's way of raising people into the likeness of his son. Do you know why God doesn't have to raise money? Because it is God's money. God gave me the energy, the job, the, the ability to work and to, and to do my job. And so God has blessed me with all these things. And those earnings, I'm, I'm meant to give back to God. And God only asks for 10% instead of 90%. And it's all his anyway, but we joyfully give back to God. And, not, and 10% has been a standard in the word of God as well as in churches to help the ministry move forward. But here's what happens when we give. We also have the opportunity to watch God be generous and faithful right back to us. And here's the bigger picture of giving. I want you to keep this in mind. When you give to the church, we are giving to God and his mission through this church, locally and globally. Locally and globally. Let me show you some pictures. I think sometimes we lose sight of the impact we're making through our giving, so I wanted to show you some things. In the bigger picture of it all, this is missionaries that we've been helping out since 2017. We actually renewed our giving to them without taking an offering for them, just out of faith because you've been so generous in, our, in your giving. And so <clears throat> we continue to actually serve them and help them with finances. This is Mike and Jess Brown. They're missionaries to Honduras. And there was a pastor there that's been raising up other pastors uh, for 18 years. His name is Pastor Juan. And he teaches people in a remote village in Honduras. And I've seen the video. I'll actually post it later on Facebook for people to see. And people would travel a day just to get to the Bible training class with Pastor Juan. And just to get there, they would sleep overnight in the middle of the jungle whether they were hiking or horseback riding, to get to training. Now, I live 15 minutes down the road. So what they decided to do was plant a, a Bible school near the city where there's bus transportation. Now, this was in 2019. The land was bare. There was nothing there. Because of your giving to our general, just everyday ties, every week ties, and to missions giving, we were able to help accomplish this in the past two weeks. This is the finished product. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have numerous missionaries in our list that we serve monthly. We gave, you know what we did for Christmas time? We doubled all their gifts during Christmas because of how generous you were in your giving. And people were messaging us going, what, what is this? Am I, am I supposed to get this? Was this a mistake? No, it was a gift. Just check your email. We try to let you know. <laughs> so, but what's going to happen here is 200 students can learn, and they can also stay the night instead of have to travel so far. And then guess what they'll do? They'll return the following week for education. They're training up. You know what we're doing? We're helping Bible teachers in Honduras be raised up, pastors, ministers, through our giving. <clears throat> so cool. Check out this photo. We, we had our youth and young adults getting baptized a couple of weeks ago here in this room. And we were able to water baptize eight students and four young adults in one week. Pastor Brandon and Lindsay are doing a great job and his team and all of his volunteers that are serving with him. But this is just uh, pictures of that night of us praying over those students, eight students who gave have given their life to Christ and made the next step of being water baptized, their families and friends were right there praying over them. It was a beautiful sight. Beautiful sight. <clears throat> I skipped over our G team ministry. The Ellis family goes out on a regular basis with a team in our, in our city of Dover. If, if people can't come to our church, we'll take church to them. Now, We've been trying to bless Ken Ellis and his family, but they refuse. They refuse. 
They will not let us help them buy pizzas and things like that. So Mr. Ellis is tithing to the church, but also buying pizzas and supplies for these kids every time he goes out. And he's doing church where they are. And they're actually not here today, probably, because they're at the neighborhood today. And that's what we do. So sometimes they do it on Saturdays, sometimes they do it on Sundays, just depending on the availability. Because we are the church, not just on Sundays, but every day. And the church is mobile and moves outside these walls to serve and to make an impact. Thank the Lord for GT. And by the way, we've had people 20 years later, after being a part of GT, come to this church. 20 years later. It's worth every single soul. Every single dime, every single time we serve, it is worth it. So let me get practical here. By the way, here's a statistic, latest statistic. Only 10 to 25% of Christians are tithing to their church. And we are giving less than we were during the Great Depression. The Great Depression, on average, Christians were giving 3.3%. Two years ago, the statistic was from 2.5%. Let's prioritize serving and giving. Let's prioritize serving and giving. So let me, let me land the plane of this message today. This is how we grow. We serve, and we grow so many ways through serving. We give. We grow so many ways through giving. But let me encourage you with this. Serving and giving is not a waste of your time or money. Let me show you why. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Do you know why it's not in vain? Because when you serve God, you're making an impact for eternity. That is true. We're making a difference that's going to last for eternity. Giving to God's work is not a waste of money. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not stir up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, when I read that again this week, I was like, oh my goodness, where's my heart? Is it in heaven already? Or is it only here? When we invest our time of serving and our money to giving to the kingdom of God, your heart is already thinking of eternity. That's so key. Is your heart in eternity already? Is it in heaven? You know we're just passing through, right? <clears throat> I, um, I, always, I, I joke, but I also am being serious with this. Um, people will say, pastors, the church is, um, they're, they're money hungry. And they're, they're always asking for money. And uh, maybe some are like that. Um, I know one, one thing, we're getting things done with ours. And, but I gotta say, um, I made a mistake of ordering something on walmart.com. And the week of Black Friday, I got 12 to 14, I lost count. I got 12 to 14 emails from Walmart asking me for money, asking me to buy their products. That's not including Target or Amazon. I got zero emails from a church asking for money. I got zero emails from a church saying invest in our ministry. And by the way, I'd rather invest in something that's not gonna melt under the wrath and fire of God. I'd rather invest in eternity. Sure, there's been abuses in churches. I'm sure there has been, because unfortunately there's corruption everywhere, isn't there? But the key that someone told me one day is, is obey God no matter what. Be obedient to God no matter what. We don't need a bunch of things. You know what's gonna happen, by the way? When we begin to prioritize serving and giving first, this is what happens. By proactively spending your time serving and giving money to kingdom work, it helps you say no to wasteful investments of time and money. Someone told me this this past week. You don't see a U-Haul following a hearse. It's true. 
I've done quite a few funerals. I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse because stuff ain't going to matter. What do we lose if we use our time and money for God? Nothing. Do you know what we gain? It's not about what we gain, but what we get to do is we get to see people in eternity one day because people are eternal. I love that. And then God is so good, he's gonna bless you with rewards and treasures in heaven. But I think the greatest blessing is eternal life, not in hell, and with God. That's the greatest blessing. But on top of that, he's gonna let you live in an amazing world you've never experienced with no pain or sorrow, no tears, all joy. That's worth giving to. That, I want my neighbors to experience that. So I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to give whatever it takes to make it happen. So let me close with this. And I did already say that. I'm so bad for saying that. If for some reason you've never started serving, never started giving, or maybe you stopped serving, or maybe you stopped giving, and there are some circumstances that cause that, I want to encourage you to be obedient to God and grow in these areas. I want to encourage you to consider the bigger picture that when you serve and you give, it's making an eternal impact. And I want to give you a quick warning and, and word of encouragement because I think the devil slips in right here. Um, and maybe even us at times can be, can be guilty of this. But I notice that you may feel overwhelmed by these things, by doing all these things that, that I'm bringing up in this series. You know, this is the, this is the fifth thing we've heard now. Worship, being to, taking the time to be together with people, praying, um, serving and giving. This can be overwhelming. Well, here's the thing, and I say this out of love. We're not supposed to add what God wants us to do on top of what we want to do. You will be crushed by that. You will not be able to properly serve God if you're also serving yourself and serving man, and serving some dreams, and, and, and going after something that conflicts with God's word, you won't be able to handle that. It needs to be that God's not overwhelming, and these are not, it needs to be that God's work is a blessing, and the other things are a burden. That's the way it needs to be. Followers of Christ are supposed to be living for God, and everything else should be second. Everything else should have to fight and contend for your time and investment as you keep God at the center of everything you do. Everything else should have to fight. God should not have to fight for our obedience and our loyalty and our time and our money and our prayers, everything. He should not have to. He should be at the center of it all. This journey of growth, number two, this journey of growth takes sacrifice in trimming things out so you can be obedient. Most of the time, being obedient first and saying yes to what God wants you to do becomes a catalyst for reviewing your time and money and seeing where you are spending it. You ready for this? Here we go. We're not supposed to be so busy that we can't serve. And we're not supposed to be in so much debt that it's hard to give or impossible to give. We're not supposed to be like that. It wasn't supposed, that's not God's plan. The Bible says, seek first his kingdom and everything else will be added unto us. God is supposed to be first in all areas of our lives. So everything else, else has to contend. And it's not a burden to serve or give, it's a joy. It's a joy. It won't be a burden because you have it there. You have the time and you have the income to help. Let me show you a picture. This picture speaks volumes in my life, in our lives. That's Pastor, Ang Pastor Kuhn and Angela Kuhn, my mom and dad, styling, looking good. Many people in that picture are still here too. Some have passed, some have left, some have gone. We are where they are right now in groundbreaking. This is where they are standing. This is the sanctuary. We are here because of the sacrifice, faithful service, and joyful giving of those who came before us. That's, that's why we're here. <clears throat> 
cool fact, the gentleman to the left has like a little bit of like a bag. It might be holding his wife's purse. Or it was his Bible. That's Brother Hall. He's in the middle between Val Branch and Eunice Barnes. That's Brother Hall. That was my father's mentor, spiritual mentor and prayer warrior. This group of people right here helped us get to where we are today. And I want to honor them and thank God for them for being willing to pray, to be together, to worship God, to serve faithfully and, and give joyfully and generously. Let's not just enjoy what God is doing here and through our church. Let's pay it forward for the next generation who might have a picture of us one day saying the exact same thing 25 years later. Ministry and missions are completed through the believer's hand of serving and the hand of giving. Thank you so much. Through the past two years, it's been a challenging, challenging season of having enough volunteers and, and um, you know, sometimes giving can be awkward or different with closures and things. Just wanna say thank you for the faithfulness and thank you that as we continue to grow in this area, we're gonna be able to do even more for the kingdom of God and so into eternity. On your way out, you'll see the prayer cards and we also have action step cards for you as well. There's some scripture for you to study more on giving. There's links on how to get involved, how to serve here. I just wanna encourage you that you seek God and why don't we stand together right now? So we're gonna close in prayer. I wanna encourage you to seek God on, on how you can grow in these areas and, and use your giftings. And by the way, this isn't just inside the church, this is outside the church. I was focusing more on the church, but we serve outside as well. And many of you serve and no one sees it, but can I encourage you with something? God sees it. Many of you give, and maybe your circumstances aren't that great to give, but yet you give. God sees it and he's gonna bless you. And even if it takes to eternity to experience it, it's gonna be worth it all. Let's pray. God, you're speaking through your word today. And Lord, it's been convicting and encouraging, uplifting, inspiring, because your word can do that. Lord, give us humble hearts, but also give us the energy and the passion to be involved in your mission here locally and globally. And Lord, we praise you for what you're doing in Honduras. We praise you for what you're doing in Spain and in France and in Asia. Lord, what you're doing in South America, in Europe, all the missionaries we're supporting around the world, in Chi Alpha, in our colleges. God, continue to use our giving, magnify it. Lord, just, God, increase it threefold. But more importantly, may it reach souls. God, thank you for the hands and feet of your people around this world and here in this room and locally making a difference. God, bless them. Bless them, Lord. God, we don't want to be missing out in the action. We want to see you in action and we want to be part of it. So God, we grow in these areas. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to say yes and then deal with everything else. God, use this offering once again, to reach even more souls as we give today. And Lord, continue to work on us and show us where we can use our giftings, our time and energy to serve one another and to, to change this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise. We thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. God bless. Thank you, God. God, we thank you. God bless you, church. Love you. Have a great Sunday.